There we go. Can you guys hear me now? Just giving a test. Can you guys hear me? So looks like I'm getting, okay, there we go. Sorry guys, a uh, little bit of technical difficulty. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna hit control off delete, Stu. Uh, I know what that does. Um, all right, well, I guess I'll get restarted then. So we're gonna be tying up Fly Called the Thunderhead tonight. And a uh, cool pattern came out of uh, Smoky Mountains. So it is a local pattern for us. And well, sort of local. And the cool thing about this fly, it's a hair wing. So, as I was showing earlier, it's got this hair piece here. Um, it's got, the, you know, a little bit of hair coming up for a wing, and it's a single post. So it makes it a pretty easy one to tie. It is some relation to the Adams, so kind of cool that, you know, we all know, we all know the Adams is one of those classic patterns that we all should be fishing. Um, I chose this fly tonight because, one, it's pretty easy. Two, we're in... The time of year on our brook trout streams that a fly like this tied in a 12 in this color is one that I definitely would be uh, thinking highly to tie on first. Um, so what we've got is we're starting to get our March browns. Yeah, I know it's April. <laughs> Gotta love it. Um, and the guys over at Mossy Creek and their weekly uh, fishing report have been talking about March browns are starting. March browns are starting. Time, you know, it's time for us to throw some size 12s, which is, that's what size this fly is, and get out there and have some fun and go play with some brook trout. So, this fly is deer hair for a tail. That's deer body hair. I'm using a brown dubbing. I am using dry fly dubbing. You don't have to. Um, I like to use a grizzly hackle, but you don't have to. If you've got another color of hackle, that's fine. And then... Traditionally, this would actually be a white wing. Yeah, I live in, um, I, I, we live in Central Virginia. We don't do white wings. We learned from uh, the Mr. Rapidan that the yellow wing is a very good option. Um, so it's almost like an indicator version of this fly. Traditionally, that'd be white. That's now been turned to uh, yellow. So this fly, like I said, it's older pattern. This would be called the chocolate thunderhead. Um, <laughs> doing some research. And uh, found out this would be called a chocolate thunderhead because it's tied in brown. Traditionally, be tied in like an Adams gray, so like that color gray right there. Um, but we've got March browns coming. Also, I want to imitate some March browns. Let's get started with this fly. It's a pretty, you know, for a dry fly, it's pretty easy. Now I'm the first one to tell people I don't tie a pretty dry fly. I tie a pretty ugly dry fly. Is what I tie. I've got no problem with that. I don't even try to pretend like I'm, you know, some amazing dry fly tire. I'm a, uh, I'm a hack at it. The other thing I'm going to do tonight that's a little different from this fly, traditionally I would use like a brown or a black thread. For you guys, tonight I'm actually going to use an orange. Um, so this is an 8 op thread, so it's a really fine thread. I'm trying to not get a whole lot of buildup when I'm tying this fly. So first thing we're going to want to do, put the thread on, wrap back. Get to the very back of the hook. And the first thing we're going to grab is out of our deer hair patch. Uh, you could use hackle fibers. You could use elk hair. Um, you could even use bucktail. Bucktail I would lean away from just because it's really fine at the tips and you're really just using the tips. So, you know, for a fly like this, you're not going to use a whole lot. So I would lean away from bucktail. But if that's all you got and you want to tie some of these up, you know what? The fly police are not going to come after you. Um, and I'll also tell you guys this. It's a dry fly. The first couple of times that you tie dry flies, and the first couple of times you tie a specific kind of dry fly, they're going to be ugly. It's part of the game. Um, dry flies, especially when you start looking at some of the classic ones, they're... They're notoriously difficult for a reason. They're all about proportion. So you've got to kind of learn how to eye everything. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the stuff out of the out of this end. And I'm looking at it. I've got literally maybe 10 fibers. I am going to stack this just because I want to. 
Um, you don't have to, but I'll do what I want. So, and what that does, that gives us a really cool tail um, with some variegation in it. You know, it's got a couple different colors and it's going to be a really thin tail. So it's very much like a, you know, like a mayfly would be. And that's what we're trying to imitate here. Um, while brook trout are pretty opportunistic feeders, and trust me, you could put on a size 10 stimulator and probably catch just as many fish. If you wanted to go out there and try to be a little bit more accurate to what's going on, um, kind of use brook trout as a chance to practice for rainbows or browns, like on mossy or something. You want to try to work on that matching the hatch. This is a situation where you could do it. And if you get it a little bit wrong, you still got a good chance of catching fish. Um, and for me, a lot of times my, what I call practice situations are exactly that where I'm not going to need it to be exactly perfect. I want it to be a little bit off. I want it so that if I'm a little bit off, I'm still going to catch fish and I'm going to feel good that I actually know what I'm doing because a big key to all of fly fishing is confidence. So we're going to tie in the tail. We're going to want about half a body length. Well, three quarters. That'll work. So Do one light wrap around, two light wrap around, and then just start pulling. And what you'll get is a little bit of flare on the tail. Now I'm going to do a couple light wraps up towards the front. Just to kind of put a little bit of a body in there. And Mayfly, remember, their, uh, their genus name is, is Ephemeroptera. Ephemeral. So I think of angelic. Think, you know, just think of like an angel. So the next thing we're going to tie in is our wing. For this, and I should have pulled it out of the packaging so you don't have to hear it crinkling, is I'm going to use a calf tail. Um, I'm going to use yellow calf tail. You could use calf body here. That would be just fine. Um, another situation where, you know, if you had to use bucktail or something like that, it would work. Um, but again, you're really just using the very ends of it. And what I'm going to pull out is maybe this much, Oop, get that into focus, is just a little bit. I mean, truly we're talking pencil lead. You know, okay. if you're feeling it, it feels like about a size of a pencil lead. Not a mechanical pencil lead, like, uh, you know, those old school style pencils that you know, are wooden and you have to sharpen and nobody probably owns anymore. So this is one. I'm also gonna stack this a little bit. So if you, you hear the stacker and you don't know what that is, this tool right here. Um, I use this tool all the time. I'll actually show you guys how I take the material out because I didn't show you this one. So you're going to stack it by smacking it on the table. You turn the tool sideways, i got to get it in front of the camera. And if you look, you've got all the hair is stacked up. So then you grab it with your left hand, pull it out. Put the stacker back together so that it's all in one piece. Then you've got this material in your left hand. This is a fun one. you got to do a little bit of uh, jockeying around because typically you're going to have material coming off, coming towards the back of the fly. Well, this material we want going towards the front. Okay, and what we want is to have it basically get tied in right about where I started my thread. Um, it just so happens that's where I want it. I want it about two eye lengths back. And we want to go about a third of the body length forward. Um, so one thing I didn't mention, I have seen this fly tied with a split wing. You remember in the beginning I said I don't tie split wings. That's why. Um, I learned about this fly as, a, uh, as just a single wing. That is how I tie this fly. So I've known about this fly for a couple of years. I've kind of watched a few things on it. I've found it in my old books. Always thought it was a cool fly. Um, so now we've got this hanging forward. And I'm not really sitting on top of the... I want it sitting on top of the hook, pointing forward. I know, it seems a little weird as a tire. You're going like, wait, why is it not going the way it should? 
get it tied down tight. One thing about calf tail is it's a little bit slippery. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that material, lift it up and back a little bit, and then wrap in front of it. You're gonna kind of create like almost like a little thread dam. We don't want it going straight up. We kind of want it on that, you know, 45, 60 degree angle forward. Um, so this is not a fly that we want that wing to be vertical. We want it kind of a little bit forward. And I will say one thing, I don't know where they came up with the name Thunderhead. I'm not a big fan of going with those plastics, Stu. Um, one, you pay a lot of money for not a lot of wings. Um, at least in my opinion, because this calf tail probably has a couple thousand flies in it. Um, and it cost me, let's see if I still got a price tag on this. No, I don't. Usually they're about seven or eight bucks. Um, the other thing is that I don't think it catches you fish. Um, I like using the calf tail, especially in this yellow, because I can see the fly. If I can see the fly, I know when the fish hits the fly. If I know when the fish hits the fly, I know when to set the hook and, hey, guess what? I just caught a fish. Theoretically. Um, it is brook trout fishing. Uh, if you're going to go brook trout fishing with this fly, brook trout are notorious for getting hooked up and then um, magically coming off. So the next thing I'm going to grab out of my dry fly dubbing is Rusty Spinner. So this is, well, if you look at that logo, that's an old logo. Um, I don't think they make this logo anymore. But yes, that's where I picked it up. Shocker. Um, I've had this packaging for 10 years, 20 years, maybe not 20, maybe 15. Um, I've had this for a really long time. And I use it, I use it for all my dry flies. It's great. Um, so what I gr am grabbing is some brown dubbing, some dark brown because that is sort of the color of a, uh, of a March brown. And that is what I'm trying to imitate here. Now, if I wanted to tie it up like an Adams, an Adams doesn't imitate anything. Um, so now we're going to have the fun of putting dubbing on. So if you don't mind, I'm actually going to zoom out. And you can see a whole pile of flies sitting on the drying rack behind them. And how you put dubbing on is actually pretty simple. You put it, you basically put it up against the thread. And then you run your fingers kind of like that, you know, against each other. And what it'll do is it'll actually spin that dubbing on. It creates what we call the dubbing noodle. And you're going to want eh, two, three inches worth of dubbing noodle. Um, fairly thin. One of the tricks with a dubbing noodle is if you can get it thin, you can always put more wraps on. But if you make it too thick, it's really hard to be able to get it thin enough. Um, and one thing I like about the dry fly dubbing is it allows you to get really thin. Um, that's one of the differences between dry fly and like a nymph dubbing is that dry fly dubbing allows you to be able to go really thin. Nymph is typically going to be a little, a little bit heavier. Um, the other thing is that nymph dubbing is actually heavier than water. Dry fly dubbing is like right around the weight of water. So dry fly dubbing will help your fly float a little bit. So now we're just going to take this dubbing noodle. We're going to wrap it forward. And if I didn't have this blaze orange thread, you would never see it. So, went to just behind where we tied in our wing. Now we're gonna go ahead and grab our tackle. As you all know, I love the Whiting 100 packs because you get a whole lot of hackle. Um, it costs a little bit more, but it's really easy when I need a size 12, I just grab a size 12 um, 100 pack. So, and I've got this in Grizzly because I like Grizzly. So what I did is I stripped off a bit on the end, and I'm going to tie this in. Two, three wraps, and then try to get that little bit of extra in front. And now we're going to take our dubbing. We're going to wrap, and I'm actually going to go backwards because I kind of feel like it tonight. So we're going to do about three wraps, hopefully about three behind. The uh, wing, I'm going to pull it forward and I'm going to do, try to do about five wraps in front. So 
it's going to be pretty heavily hackled. Um, there's a reason for wanting that extra heavy hackle. We're talking about for trout fishing our high mountain streams. We want as much flotation as we can get. So that should be good. One, two, three. That's a little awkward to do. So now theoretically we get a phone call, we can walk away. Um, I, you know, don't want to do that if we don't have to, but if I do, I do. Now we're going to trim off while trimming the fewest number of hackles possible. Um, you're always going to get a few. Don't worry about it, you know. And like I said, this is the kind of fly you're going to do a few times. And you're going to practice. Um, and you know what? If it turns out a little bit ugly, you know, not perfect, hey, you got a topwater bluegill fly. Uh, not going to say it's going to live super long because of the fact that that hackle is exposed. But if you can catch five or six bluegill on it, who cares? You know what? Use it. Use it till it doesn't work anymore, and then, then cut all the material off the hook and tie up another fly on it. So, now if you notice, I got some hackles going forward. Funny is I can't see those in, in like my own vision, but I can see them uh, in the screen. I'm going to take it, I'm going to stroke as much back as I can. I'm going to create a little tiny head. Oop, I got a couple that don't want to. There we go. I got one now that doesn't want to work with me. Well, you know what, buddy? Your days are numbered. So I'm going to take that one. I'm going to have to do this literally by looking at my computer screen. Don't cut the thread. Don't worry, guys. I've cut the thread doing that more times than I want to count. So basically, the fly's done at this point. So now you've got... Now you have to decide how you want to finish the fly. You could use your whip finisher, or in this case, this is actually one time I will tie, I will use the half hitch. I like a half hitch when I do a, a hackled fly, just because of the fact that I can control where that half hitch lands better. And I'm gonna use on my bodkin, you know, the handy dandy bodkin that, we, that I have, I have got a little, it's actually a half hitch tool on the end. I use this tool so often when I'm tying up flies like this. So we're gonna do one wrap without getting hung up. Rotate up. And basically if you look, I'm gonna land that right where I want it. Um, you don't have to have a half hitch tool like this. Honestly, a big pen, if you take the uh, like the pen part out, the ink part out, does just fine. Um, you guys haven't noticed we use those quite a bit. Um, a big pen with the ink part taken out can do a lot of different things in fly tying. Um, so, but yeah, something like that. And I just do three half hitches. And then I'm going to take... Well, actually, I'm going to, let me trim the thread first. And I must have a my old scissors. Because they're not cutting. There we go. Um, my scissors are starting to get dull, so it's getting to be time to send them off to be resharpened or just buy a new pair. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my head cement, otherwise known as Sally Hansen's. Been using this stuff for years. This particular thing of it is probably three or four years old. Um, this is the kind of material that you can go a long way, and it's just clear nail polish. Yes, I just covered up the eye really good with that. That's going to be fun. So I'm going to just kind of take my bodkin, clear up the eye a little bit. That Sally Hansen should be dried up pretty soon. And that's going to make for a pretty durable little fly. And if you look at it, it's a pretty good looking little mayfly, which is kind of what we're trying to do here. This is a mayfly imitation. So it's going to, you know, it's going to look like, when you think about it, when they're on the water, when mayflies are on the water, if you remember from my bugs, uh, kind of my primer on bugs, they sit with the wings vertical in the, you know, when they're sitting on the water, their wings will be sitting vertical. Well, you kind of got that yellow wing sitting vertical and it's going to sit there and that's going to get in the water 
And then when you got all this hackle in the bottom, one thing about it is, you know, I think the, fly, the fish are looking at this fly like this. So it kind of looks like legs, and there's a whole pile of hackle on the bottom, and that's making little dimples along with the tail. They got little dimples on the surface. That's what the fish are seeing. Um, they're seeing that, and then they're seeing that, you know, kind of silhouette that looks familiar. Um, kind of like a Philly cheesesteak when you really think about it, you know. Philly cheesesteak, the silhouette of a Philly cheesesteak is kind of looks like a lot of things. But if you're in the mood for one and you see a sub floating over top of you, you might take a bite out of it hoping it's a Philly cheesesteak. So, I don't know where that just came from, but hey, things that pop into my mind. So that is our first one done, and I will say one thing when I tied this. I made my wing a little bit long. Um, it's fine, it'll work, but even I'll admit, I, like I said, I'm not the most amazing dry fly tire. Um, I've got a few friends who are just phenomenal at it. Um, that's not me. But I wanted to do uh, this fly today because it's prime time to be throwing these. The other cool thing is that right now a lot of our streams are blown out um, just due to all that weather that came through on Saturday night. I'll let you know, James River here in Richmond is blown out from that. Um, I was supposed to be going out and playing around this weekend uh, on the river, and I'm having some questions if I will be. But great, you know, brook trout streams, they drop within about two days typically. So, you know, you get a big rain, might be a little dirty of water, but it'll still be low enough to be fishable, typically. Um, every once in a while, you, every once in a while you, you get a lot more rain than you thought. But yeah, that's the first one. Now I'm gonna tie up. I'm gonna tie up another one because honestly, I'm trying to fill my box a little bit. Um, I might be heading out brook trout fishing or something of that nature this weekend, and kind of need some flies. Um, and one thing about brook trout fishing is it's a game of losing flies, it's minimizing the loss of flies because you're gonna hang them in trees. It happens. It happens to the best of us. Um, you know, I don't know anybody who doesn't hang a tree every once in a while, at least. Um, me, if I haven't been doing it in a while, it's more often than I'd like to talk about. So, let's do this again. Tying in, and I probably should have mentioned this, it's a standard, this actually, well, these were in the wrong box, but this is just a dry fly hook, standard dry fly, um, size 12. This, these happen to be big eye ones, so they're a straight eye. And I don't totally love them, but I think I picked them up because it was the only thing available. And they do have a larger eye, so it's easier to get the tippet through. So if you're having some trouble um, with, you know, that, you're tying up small flies and can't really see the eye of the hook, um, that might be an option is to go to, like, a big eye hook. And they do make those, um, you know, at least in the smaller in the smaller flies. I don't know of anything, in, like, in a streamer. Um but I've never also really looked at that point because once I'm in, you know, size six, I'm generally just not worrying about it at this moment. Well, let's do this fly again. So I'm going to start. If you notice, I like to start this fly kind of where I want that uh, wing to kind of pop off. That is so that I kind of have that point set in my head to start with. So, and one thing with these materials that we are using, I like to put down a coating of thread um, just because that's going to make it harder for that material to spin around the hook. So now we need to grab our deer hair. We're going to, you know, tie this one, tie up good old deer hair. Yeah, you can see there are multiple colors mixed in. Um, like I said, I'm trying to get like 10 or 15 or so. So that's the kind of the fun. So. that up a little bit. So we've got all of them and I got a bit more than I did last time, but that is just fine. That'll work. 
And you wonder why I say why I'm not great at uh, tying dry flies? The hmm, that'll work. It's probably not the attitude I should have. All right, tie it in. Man, that looks ugly on the camera. Looks fine from my view, but I will say, guys, you've got higher definition vision than even I get right now. Um, it's kind of a kind of the joys that you have. You get higher definition of just fly tying than he gets. All right, so now we're gonna grab the good old calf tail. Use you know use calf body hair. Use something like that. Um, I bought calf tail years ago, and I have been tying off this thing for a long time. Got it. Pull out the shorts. There's always going to be a few. Quite a bit more this time. I really wanted to get a this one. I wanted to get a good solid wing on. I'm going to make it a little shorter. Um. So satisfying to open up your uh, open it up and have the hairs be more or less all the same length. One of those just satisfying things in life. So I'm like I said, I'm gonna go a little bit shorter this time. I'm gonna go to probably about half a body, eh, maybe three quarters. Went a little long last time and it'll work. Um it'll be a little bit easier to actually see. So loose wrap couple of loose wraps so that basically you can hold it and then you can kind of spin that hair so that it's up on top of the hook. Because uh, when I first do the wrap, it's going to try to wrap around the hook. Um, and we're not trying to spin this like it's uh, spun deer hair. I've been wanting to play around with some spun deer hair brook trout flies, but I can't get Brian to tie them for me since he is a master of stacking and spinning deer hair. And if you've been wondering, Brian will be back. Um, he's had some things going on that he's got to take care of. And to be honest, guys, I got some things coming on pretty soon that I'm going to be taking care of. Um, luckily, not at the same time as Brian. So when we talked about it, uh, we have talked about going to a little bit less often of doing these. Since, um, you know, Project Healing Waters talking about going to more, you know, doing some little bit of in-person kind of stuff. Um, you know, unfortunately, I won't be able to participate with that because I live in Richmond. Uh, I've been helping you guys out virtually, and I've been sitting in the background for a long time helping. Um, so had a couple of hairs that were getting away from me and took care of that problem. So, all right, so now we've gotten our wing sitting, and if you look, that's probably about 45, you know, somewhere between 45 and 60 degrees. I'm gonna tell you this, there's not gonna be some police that come out, um, especially on some of these really older patterns, um, because of the fact that a lot of people don't know everything about them, um, they don't know what it's supposed to look like, uh, which is also one of the reasons why I like older patterns, is because generally people don't know what they're supposed to look like so, go ahead and grab our Dusty Brown. We're gonna make this, put this on, it's pretty easy stuff. Um, dubbing can be difficult. I wish I could find a way to make it easy. Um, dubbing, something about dubbing Either it works for you that day, or it doesn't. And if it's not working for you, don't get mad, don't get frustrated, don't go throwing stuff across the room. Um, it's one of those things, I've never understood it, but dubbing, 
for as long as I've used it has had, I've had good days with the dubbing and bad days. Some days the dry fly dubbing is super easy to put on. Other days it is the biggest pain. Um, and the nymph dubbing is easy. Some days the nymph dubbing is really hard to put on. So we're going to put this on. We're going to do our wraps. Remember we're trying to get a thin little body. It can get a little thicker up, you know, as you get up towards the chest area. Um, so that's a mayfly kind of tends to be very thin. When you think about it, mayflies, they skip leg day. They always skip leg day. Just think of it kind of as the way the mayfly body is built. Um, they're very thin through the lower part. And then, like, their chest area is usually pretty, pretty beefy. Um, with the nymphs, that's an easy way to, you know, think about when you're tying their nymphs. Um... And this is actually one of those ones you guys kind of wonder sometimes when we talk about fishing like a CK nymph. This is one of the things that it imitates. It's a March Brown. Um, there are a lot of March Browns on in our streams. One of the cool things. And I saw a post from one of my buddies who lives down in Lynchburg of a salmon fly. Um... If you guys don't remember, I actually did my research project in college on salmon flies. They're super cool. Um, a lot of people told me they didn't exist in the state of Virginia. Yes, they're here. Uh, salmon flies are a really cool insect, giant stone fly, uh, like three inches long, giant. Um, think about it this way. This fly is, I mean, you know, you always think of a thumb being like an inch. Not quite, not even an inch long. Um, and this is considered a big this is considered a big uh, mayfly. So, time to do our wraps. Remember, three behind. And then we pull the wing forward. Kind of start wishing we had a third hand. I really need a third hand. I got a little too close to the eye. Oh well. Got five wraps in the front. And I just dropped my scissors, luckily into my chair and not onto the ground. All right, so I got a little close to the eye on that one. It's fine, we'll make it work. So you get something like that, you kind of start crowding up the eye a little bit on these flies. That is where the using the half hitch tool comes in handy because we can actually kind of start pushing that back a little bit. Well, what I'm going to do to start with is I'm going to take my hands, I'm going to sweep everything back. I'm going to try to build up a little bit of a head. Just give me some room to work with there. Um, yeah, not super pretty, but it'll work. Something tells me if I put this thing on with a little bit of dry fly floating, and I go up and fish like the Rapidan with this, um, you know, go fish the roads up in the park. Go fish, you know, the upper Conway. Uh, go fish the North Fork of the Mormons, the South Fork of the Mormons. You know, go over to the Dry River um, over in Harrisonburg. Go do something like that. Go put this on kind of starting midday, especially if, since we're, it looks like we're going to have some cool mornings coming up. Um, that's going to slow down the bug life in the early in the morning. But, you know, kind of starting about 11 or so, put something like this on. Lights out. You know, make sure you got floating on it. Make sure it's floating. Lights out. Just go catch fish. Um, you know, we're on the time of year for brook trout where, you know, it's time to go. Uh, Midwinter, yes, you can catch them. They get tough. Um, they're sluggish. They're slow. This time of year, water temps are literally in their happy zone. Um, you know, depending on who you are and where your happy zone is, you might, you know, you might like 70 degrees. Well, it's in their happy place. And they are about as active as they're going to get. 
you know, for the next few weeks. And you can get out there. You can get into them. Um, one thing I would say is don't go bouncing stream to stream. Kind of learn one, catch fish in it, learn one, and go do something else. Um, and then go to another stream. That's kind of the best way for, especially for trout in general. And in my opinion, fishing is go to a place, you don't catch fish, and you don't see, you know, any good signs or you haven't ever heard of any fish there. Okay, bail on it. If you go to a place that's well-known, you might take two or three trips um, to figure it out and to figure out where those fish are. And along with the fact that the fish move from time to time. Um, so where we're going to find them right now is kind of towards the upper end of the pools. Not quite in the riffles, but right below them. Um... That is where we're going to find our brook trout right now. So you're going to want to cast as high up in the pool as you can. But at the same time, when you come up on a pool, don't be afraid to cast towards the lower end. Um, sometimes the really big fish will be hanging down there. So this fly also, you know, you want to tie this fly up in like a yellow. Um, in a, well, this is called pale morning done, but a uh, sulfur yellow. Um, so this kind of yellowish color here that is really not showing with the light. Um, that is an awesome imitation of a sulfur. And we have a hatch of those coming off in the near future. Um, sulfur time will be starting up. They hatch right at dusk around here. So it's a late hatch. It's a late in the day hatch. It's a, And it is an epic one on, say, Mossy Creek or... Beaver Creek. Um, you know, if you can fish the Lower Jackson, I've actually heard that it's not had great sulfur hatches the last few years, which is kind of saddening to me because I love fishing sulfur hatches. Um, and when I said, you know, late in the day, I mean, you're pushing whether or not you should be going home because it's getting dark. Um, I have fished sulfur hatches into the dark. It's what they, it's when they're coming off and the trout key in on them. But, you know, you could tie this in a brown you could tie this in a yellow um tie it up obviously in atoms in, <laughs> in the color that it was intended to be in the you know gray um you know this is one of those this can become you know a single dry fly you tie in multiple sizes tie it down to a 16 if you're that brave up to a size 10 um the only difference when you're doing you know different sizes is gonna be Really, one, the amount of material you put in your tail, and that's a personal preference thing. Um, I like, for my brook trap, putting a lot of material in my tail. Um, if I was going to be tying this as a sulfur for going over to Mossy, I'm going to have that material. I'm not going to use nearly as much. Um, but the only difference when you're tying this is, one, you know, your tail, uh, the length of your tail, the length of, you know, your wing, because you want that to match and be a little bit longer than your hackle. That's the big difference is your hackle length. That is one of the fun ones in uh, dry fly fishing, in dry fly tying. That's why I like the Whiting 100 packs, because you want your hackle to be just longer than the hook. If you look, that's just barely a little bit longer, um, and that's how you pick out the right hackle. Um, so it's, you know, what I like to use, I like to use those... Uh, if you want to get a patch, I know Brian buys uh, like the hen saddle pat or not saddle, the hen patches, or not hen, sorry, rooster patches. Don't tie it with hen. Hen's, uh, hen makes for soft hackles, and we're not trying to do a soft hackle dry. Um, though those do exist. But, you know, I like to use the 100 packs. Also, the other thing is that typically you're going to try to match your thread color to your body color. Or maybe use black, because the heads on these flies, you know, they're basically giant eyeballs, so it's gonna be black. Um, I used orange so that it would be easier for you guys to see kind of what my thread was doing. And I'm actually gonna say this, I'm kind of digging the look on it. Um, so, you know, don't always take my advice on thread color. Um, sometimes you gotta do what you wanna do and tie them up and see what you think. You know, and for all you know, you could tie it up in purple and go, you go out there and fish and kill them on purple. Which, by the way, yes, that would be something that possibly would work. Um, you know, and that becomes your favorite color. But this could very easily turn into 
the main, you know, dry fly for imitating a mayfly for you. Pretty simple, it doesn't have a split wing. So remember, that wing is one piece, it is not two. Um, split wings are fun in the sense that you've gotta be able to tie them there a little bit more finicky. This is a pretty simple one. And, you know, when it comes to dry flies, it's a pretty simple one. Um, it's not quite elk hair cats, it's not quite, quite stimulator simple. But, you know, when it comes to mayflies, it's about as simple as they come. So, and I did see Stu make the comment about he wanted to uh, do top water um, for the next fly. We are going to be doing a uh, doing a bluegill fly. I got some ideas um, of what I want to do. I want to do some top water stuff. Uh, I kind of didn't know if you guys wanted top water subsurface. Uh, we are coming up on bluegill spawning season, and that's about the only fish that I have zero problem with uh, targeting while they're spawning because they just make a billion of themselves. Um. So, you know, we'll do something. I'll, uh, I got a few ideas. I'll put them together. But I want to thank everyone for showing up tonight. I think we had a good time. I know it's a little bit short, but this is a fairly, you know, fairly easy fly, fairly quick tie. And honestly, it's one of those ones, uh, I mean, I used to help fill my box. So, and the thing that I do with this one is I do use the yellow wing to kind of make it almost like a Mr. Rapidan, which in our area is a extremely well-known fly. Um, designed by Harry Murray uh, over at Murray's Fly Shop. Harry was another prominent, actually I can't say was, still he's still around. Um, Harry is another very prominent fly designer in our area. Um, Chuck wasn't the only one. Uh, we are actually very lucky in the sense that we have got for whatever reason, Central Virginia has a lot of great developers of flies. Um, and they go from everything from the old school to, I mean, one of the current hot patterns that everyone wants to tie is, you know, a pattern called the Game Changer. You won't see us teach it because it involves way too much work, um, very specialized materials, but that was developed by Blaine Chocolate down in Lynchburg. I mean, it's, you know, truly, it's another local pattern to us. Uh, I have friends all over the country you know, are like, oh my God, have you met Blaine? I'm like, yeah, I met Blaine. He's cool. You know, but just another fly for us. So I want to thank everyone for coming. Hope we all had a fun night. I want to say get out there, get some, get fishing. Um, You know, I'm talking about brook trout because it's right now is the time to go do it. We got another couple of weeks till the uh, bass and bluegill really start up in the lakes. So, hey, you know, while it's warm, but the bass aren't super biting, Go out there. Oh. John, you're going to have to teach the John Frog. That was really a cool fly. Um, I don't know if anybody follows us on Facebook. John actually sent us uh, some flies he was playing around with. That was a really cool looking fly. Um, we might actually have to make you uh, teach one night and uh, teach us that one. So, I want to thank everyone for coming. Y'all have a great night.